know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock. It's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway. Headliners every night from 11 on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Saturday nights on GB News. From 6pm, I'll give you my unique take on the world today. Then at 7, it's me, Calvin Robinson, with my common sense crusade. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Five times the opinion. Join us every Saturday from 8pm as we debate the week's stories. With us four, plus a special guest. And at 9, of course, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Saturday nights on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. It's nine o'clock and this is Mark Dolan tonight. In my big opinion, woke former Tory party leader William Hague has told women to get over it when biological males join female-only groups, including the Women's Institute. I'll be dealing with that prize numpty in just a couple of minutes. In the big story, we'll be remembering the late great comic genius Barry Humphreys, the man behind housewife turned superstar Dame Edna Everidge. In my take at 10, I'll be tackling Meghan Markle, whose attacks on the country continue, the just stop oil protesters who need to grow up and get a job, and why Britain needs to start making babies again. Rest assured, watching this programme is the ultimate aphrodisiac. So, big guests, big stories and big opinions. I'll be dealing with that abject fool, William Hague, after the headlines with good old Ray. Thanks, Mark. Here's the latest from the GB Newsroom. The Prime Minister has chaired an emergency Cobra meeting as fierce fighting in Sudan enters its second week. Government forces are battling with a paramilitary group over control of the capital Khartoum. Sudan's military claims foreign nationals and diplomats, including those from the UK, US, France and China, are to be evacuated. The World Health Organization says more than 400 people have been killed and thousands injured since the violence began. The SNP has appointed Stuart MacDonald as the party's new treasurer following the resignation of MSP Colin Beattie. Mr Beattie stepped down after he was arrested by police investigating SNP finances. He was later released without charge. The party's former chief executive, Peter Morell, who is also Nicola Sturgeon's husband, was also arrested and questioned before being released. Police are investigating the use of £600,000 in donations meant for the independence referendum. 
A serving member of the British Armed Forces has appeared in court charged with offences under the Official Secrets Act. 36-year-old Thomas Newsom is accused of sharing highly sensitive military information. He's alleged to have shared a 10-page document through social media to two senior officers who did have clearance and one civilian who did not. Prosecutors claim if the information was leaked, it would have caused a real and immediate threat to British people outside of the UK. He's due in court again on Friday. Well, the family of Stephen Lawrence have held a memorial service in Trafalgar Square to mark the 30th anniversary of his murder. The 18-year-old was killed in a racist attack while waiting for a bus in south-east London. It's alleged that the original investigation was hindered by racism and police corruption, meaning it took almost 20 years for two of his killers to face justice. Labour have condemned Dominic Raab's behaviour since his resignation yesterday, calling it appalling and saying he shouldn't be blaming his accusers for his own downfall. The former Deputy Prime Minister resigned after an investigation upheld two of the bullying allegations made against him. Mr Raab claims a minority of those within Whitehall are, quote, effectively trying to block government. Belarus's military have completed nuclear weapons launch training in Russia. It comes after President Putin said Moscow would station tactical nuclear weapons in the neighbouring country. It's thought that warheads could be moved to storage facilities in Belarus by July. Many have seen this as a warning to NATO over its military support for Ukraine. And tributes have poured in for Australian entertainer Barry Humphreys, who's died at the age of 89. During a seven-decade career, he was best known for his alter egos, including Dame Edna Everidge and Sir Les Patterson. Rob Brydon has described him as a true great who inspired me immeasurably. Ricky Gervais tweeted that Dame Edna was arguably the greatest comic persona ever. We're on TV, online, on DAB Plus Radio and, of course, on TuneIn 2. This is GB News. Back now to Mark Dolan. Isn't it great to have Ray Addison back on the show? He returns in an hour's time. Welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. It's Saturday, so let's have some fiery debates. Let's have... Uh, a little bit of uh, balance, let's have a different worldview and let's have some fun along the way. In my big opinion, woke former Tory party leader William Haig has told women to get over it when biological males join female-only groups. I'll be dealing with him in just a moment. In the big story, we'll be remembering the late great comic genius, as you heard from Ray's bulletin, Barry Humphreys, who sadly has died. The man behind housewife turned superstar and one of my absolute comedy heroes, Dame Edna Everidge. My Mark Meets guest is the man born in a caravan at the side of a road in Leicester. But he went on to make a multi-million pound fortune and became the richest Romany gypsy in British history. His neighbour is Cliff Richard nonetheless, and he's a TV star, and he tells his amazing story later in the show. In my Take at 10, I'll be tackling Meghan Markle, whose attacks on the monarchy continue. The Just Stop Oil protesters who need to grow up and get a job. And why Britain needs to start making babies again. Rest assured, watching this programme is the ultimate aphrodisiac. Plus, tonight's newsmaker is the queen of US showbiz royal and political reporting, Kinsey Schofield, with all of the big stories on the other side of the pond, including huge excitement stateside in the build-up to the King's coronation. Mark Dolan tonight is the home of the papers with tomorrow's front pages from 10.30. With three top pundits who haven't been told what to say and who don't follow the script. Tonight, John Sargent, Peter Lloyd and Ashleen Horgan-Wallace. Tonight, I'll be asking the pundits, is voter ID undemocratic? Are smokers treated as second-class citizens? And is it wrong to leave a partner when they're ill? Plus your emails, especially the spicy ones, mark at gbnews.uk. And this show has a golden rule. We don't do boring, not on my watch. I just won't have it. Lots to get through, a big two hours to come. 
It is Saturday night, so grab something cold and fizzy from the fridge or fire up the kettle and tear open the custard creams. And let's get to work. We start with my big opinion. William Hague, the former Tory party leader, best known for wearing a cap at Thorpe Park, has had a roller coaster week. The ex foreign secretary, who I've always admired, appears to have lost the plot, as demonstrated by his candid interview, let's be polite, with Times Radio. In the interview, he said that the Women's Institute, a venerated and long standing organisation created as a community focused on the interests of all females, should allow trans women, that's biological males identifying as females, to join. Most egregious was the language he used in this interview, telling women to effectively get over it and get used to intact biological males joining, which surely defeats the object of the Women's Institute. I mean, I'd humbly suggest the clues in the name. It's the Women's Institute. Well, here's what William Hague told Times Radio. There are transgender people. They have changed their gender. Um, this is part of our society now. And um, I think large national organizations like the WI have to get over that and get used to that. So what have all of these women got to get over and get used to, Mr Haig? Have they got to get over and get used to double rapists accommodated in women's prisons? Have they got to get over and get used to the grim dystopia of unisex changing rooms and the awkwardness, discomfort and sometimes terror that they bring about? Has this woman got to get over it after being confronted by two men at a changing room in Primark? Take a listen to this poor woman's moving testimony. I probably shouldn't be doing this when I'm still emotional, but... I feel like I need to get the word out there. Um, so I was just in Primark um, in Cambridge. And um, I feel really stupid being emotional about this. But um, yeah, I was trying on some clothes and it was a unisex changing room, which I'm really for. And I love that because, you know, it makes everyone feel included. But twice, um, two men walked opened the curtain walked in on me um luckily both times i had i was wearing fully clothed but i could easily not have been um there you go a woman in tears in her car after a shopping trip this is progress is it mr haig have women got to get over unisex toilets as well now full disclosure we've got them here at gb news and they are loathsome we rent the building it's out of our hands Stories are now legion of schoolgirls not going to the toilet all day long because they don't want to go to a bathroom where boys will be. Now, if you know anything about boys at school, you'll know exactly why. And this is not a slander on trans people. I am passionately pro-trans. I've got friends who have been on that important journey, and I believe it's a fundamental right to identify as you wish and for that to be respected but not at the expense of the hard-won sex-based rights of others, in this case, women. This isn't about trans or non-trans. The grim reality is that to the female of the species, all males, that's right, every single male, including me, TV's Mark Dolan, Nick Knowles from DIY SOS, great entertainer, lovely guy. What about Britain's most trusted doctor, Hilary Jones? What a bedside manner. Silky-voiced crooner, Rod Stewart, total legend. Even Donald Duck, for that matter. Ask Daffy Duck. Anyone rocking the meat and two veg always has been and always will be a potential threat to women. That's just biology, I'm afraid, and history. Which is why we have single-sex spaces. And the Women's Institute has been a community, a haven and a comfort to females for decades. But William Hague seems to think that biological men who call themselves female being part of it is something which is inevitable. Charming, yet another bloke telling you to get over this and get used to it, ladies. Mr Hague, forgive me and all of the women watching and listening to this show who won't get over it 
and won't accept it and won't get used to this madness. As the suffragettes proved, women's rights were always a hill to die on, and they always will be. By blurring the lines between what a man and a woman is, William Haig has made a right tit of himself. Willie wants willies in the WI. Get over it. What's your reaction? Do you support the comments of William Hague? Do you think that trans women entering groups like the Women's Institute is completely inevitable, that society has changed? Let me know your thoughts, mark at gbnews.uk. I'll get to your email shortly, but reacting to my big opinion tonight, my trio of top pundits, TV news legend John Sargent, journalist and author Peter Lloyd, and model and actress Ashleen Horgan-Wallace. Mm. Great to have all three of you with me. Let's have a shot of John as well. Come on. He's box office. There we are. <laughs> legend. Total <laughs> legend. Well, look, we've got three legends tonight. But, <laughs> Peter, great to have you back on the show as well. Uh, do you think that William Haig is a legend in what he said to Times Radio this week? No, I think he's been so foolish. Why did he take the bait? Clearly, the presenters at Times Radio wanted to give him something that would cause controversy and get them lots of free publicity, which is exactly what he's done. Um, he should have been much more media savvy about this and just avoided the issue. But completely. wasn't he just being honest and wasn't he actually conceding what he would argue is the reality of our modern society? Maybe, but I just don't think it... I, I think he was probably out of his depth. I don't think it was really his forte. It's not his level of expertise or his area of expertise. I think he would have been better avoiding this whole maelstrom and just, you know, sticking to what he knows. OK, John Sargent, your reaction? Well, I, I must say, I mean, William Hague, I've always thought, was a wonderfully clever guy. When I met him when he was a young very young researcher, and you'd turn to William and say, what, what was the voting then? What was that? What? He'd immediately reply. And you thought, gosh, what a clever, clever young man. But the problem he's got is that, unlike an MP who's got to go back and talk to his constituents, mm. he's wonderfully, absolutely brilliant in all sorts of things, mm. but not ordinary life. He doesn't yeah. see much ordinary life. He's not connected very much with ordinary people. And there, he, in fact, is his great fault. And I, I'm sorry to say this because, as I say, I'm a fan of his. And it demonstrates that actually working MPs are more in touch with public opinion than we might think. That's it, because they know that people are very disturbed about this and they're extremely worried and that women are constantly worried about whether or not someone's going to be coming into the bathroom at the wrong moment and all that kind of thing. Mm. And it is a feature of their lives. It, women don't tend to, I don't quite know why, they don't bang on about it the whole time because it's a private matter. It's how they feel. And I, I shouldn't be saying they, because you've got a good representative here to <laughs> give their point of view. But there is that element of life. And, of course, once you start labelling it politics, not just say, oh, no, I'm talking about politics. I'm talking about how I feel and what I want to do and how I want to spend my day. And I think that's another problem. For someone like William Hague, it's all politics, theory. Mm. What, what's the policy on this? Can't we have a policy on that? And the answer is there are many things where you don't have a policy. You don't have a position paper. You don't have a committee being formed. You just ask people, what do you think about that? They say, I think it's a bit odd. I, I rather liked having separate, whatever it is. Yeah. And that's, that's the level in which most people are combating this. And the politicians and the people going on about this, particularly, dare I say it, in London, the whole sort of idea of, oh, this is the latest thing we talk about, for ordinary people, they don't consider themselves. They're, they're not meeting people right. who feel they're trans or not trans, and they're suddenly told, oh, it's like being gay in the 19th century or something. Not at all like that. It's actually a very small number of people who, particularly when they're children, are worried about their sex, and they may then actually do change their sex, but the tiny numbers involved. And this has been blown up, frankly, fairly hysterically by all sorts of people, when it, it's not... It, that isn't the way that normal people are behaving. And, and it's a dangerous gap, I think, between how people are actually behaving and what is being, quote, discussed 
the whole and time. I think we've seen that mirrored in the Brexit debates, uh, in the election of Boris Lots Johnson of in 2019, uh, and perhaps in relation to the illegal migrant crossings uh, in the Channel. But, uh, Ashleen, your thoughts on this? By definition, the most important thing tonight. <laughs> yes. I think, I think your monologue was perfect and, and hit the nail on the head. Um, it's, it's scary, as a woman, to think that, you know, you could be getting changed in a changing room. And the, it, the fact of the matter is, it, as you said, it's not, it's not somebody... It's not anti-trans, it's anti-meat and two-veg, being in the next room next to me while I'm naked and me feeling intimidated. And I mm. think that that's what need to be, needs to be looked at. And um, I think it's ridiculous. We need separate changing rooms for us women to feel uh, safe. What about the tone? Because I thought... And, and I do hold William Hague in high regard. I think he's a really decent guy. And he, he might be mm. one of those great prime ministers that, that got away. But... Um, his tone, when he said I, that women should should uh, get over this, yeah. uh, uh, get used to it. I mean, I think... <laughs> I don't think his opinion is worth anything on this, to be honest. I think we, we, we need to be asking women how we feel about it, and his tone was just... Pathetic. It wasn't humanised. It was just mm -hmm. factualised. Factualised. Yeah. Okay. Well, look. Is there any support for William Hague out there? Because this show is the home of free speech. Let me know if you think that what he had to say was fair and right. Mark at gbnews.uk. I'll get to your thoughts shortly. But next up in the big story, we will be remembering the late great comic genius Barry Humphreys, the man behind Housewife turned superstar Dame Edna Everidge. That's next. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <laughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock. It's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers. <laughs> Tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Saturday nights on GB News. From 6pm, I'll give you my unique take on the world today. Then at 7, it's me, Calvin Robinson, with my common sense crusade. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Five times the opinion. Join us every Saturday from 8pm as we debate the week's stories. With us four, plus a special guest. And at 9, of course, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Saturday nights on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's News Channel.
Uh, welcome back. I'll get to your emails very shortly. But it's time for the big story and the sad news of the passing of comedy legend Barry Humphreys. At the age of 89, Humphreys was a star of stage and screen, both as lecherous international diplomat and cheese expert, Celeste Patterson, and most famously as Australian housewife turned superstar Dame Edna Everidge, whose acerbic wit and harsh but hysterical humour made Humphreys a global icon. There were sellout tours, the royal variety performances in front of the Queen and Prince Charles, as he was then, and the chat show in which, as Dame Edna, Humphreys belittled and wound up some of the biggest stars in the world, famously making Charles and Heston wear a name badge on his jacket, which said Chuck, so she'd remember what he was called. A bright light has gone out in the world of comedy, and there's no other word for it. We have lost a genius. Uh, so let's see Dame Edna in action. My daughter Val May, who was a lovely child, Judy, you met her when she was just a little one. I brought her around to see you, bless her. <laughs> <She's>... <laughs> she is into shoplifting in a major way. <laughs> Waitrose, I said, look. <laughs> Harrods. I said you're bringing shame on the family. Can't it be Harrods or someone? <laughs> well, let's get reaction first up from the brilliant stand-up comedian and headliners star Josh Howey. Josh, was Barry Humphreys as Dame Edna funny? Yeah, of course. Uh, he, she, genius. Because you and I know plenty of successful comedians who we don't think are that funny. Yeah, yeah, of course. No, well, there, of course. I mean, in terms of... I think the word genius is bandied around maybe too much, but that, you know, he was obviously someone who that absolutely applies to. I mean, uh, the thing that I grew, you know, our generation, people in their 40s, I think particularly, you grew up with him. He was just on TV all, all the time, that character. And the other thing that I was thinking, just watching the clip and just thinking about him over the last few days, is how he was, like, mean. He was mean. You know, we talk now, everyone's like, oh, you were punching up, you can only punch up, you can't punch up. He punched everywhere. And that was the whole point about it. some of the biggest stars Well, yeah, so planet. that would arguably be, be punching up. But actually, that character was really scornful to, like, his audience. I mean, you could argue it was with love or not, but really, he was just, like, scornful to the world. Definitely. His, uh, well, actually, I guess it's hers, isn't it? Dame Edna. Dame Edna's long-suffering assistant. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Marge. And then, of course, the, the only referenced husband, right? Norm was referenced. We never met Norm. Yeah. But, but he'd had all sorts of issues with his reproductive organs, hadn't he, and all the rest of it. Yeah. So it was like toilet humour, satire, comedy roast, it was all there. Well, the thing was that he just had that range of intellect. I think to do... Mm. To be s stupid or to be silly sometimes, you just have to be very, very smart. And then he would be also incredibly witty on top of it. You know, by the way, when we're talking about comedy, it's incredibly hard to be funny <laughs> about, about that. But... Uh, it, and my dad was Australian, or still is an Australian, so it was like this was his connection to his home and he'd make us watch all the videos, but it was like a real bonding experience. Yeah, the other thing that's uh, interesting, I mean, we, we've got the likes of Inspector Clouseau and others, these great iconic characters, but Dame Edna was three-dimensional. Mm. So this is a character that had her own chat show uh, that, that did public appearances and all the rest of it. So this was great acting as well. This was a great creation which was very real. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's weird because I'm sort of saying he, she, because it, they are two separate entities. It apparently, isn't... apparently, when Barry Humphreys was getting made up as mm. Dame Edna, the voice would come straight away. And so once, once the slap was going on the glasses, it was Edna all the way. And I don't think Barry was ever Barry whilst dressed as Edna, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. And, I, and you could sort of see that commitment that would just come through in his comedy. But you think of that creation as just their own entity, as a different human being. Yeah, and uh, I don't know, man. It's just it's it's sad. And reading these stories, I didn't realize like I'd never read like a biography about him. But reading some of the obituaries, like the guy was basically a genius. Yeah, like, very he well had, read. Intellectual. Yeah, he had tens of thousands of books, and he was a dadaist and all this clever stuff. I mean. Yeah, all that clever stuff that we don't understand. Yeah. Well, look, uh, let's speak to someone far cleverer than both of us: the former Australian High Commissioner to the UK, Alexander Downer. Mr. Downer, thank you so much for joining us on a very sad occasion. But we've got to celebrate a great life and a great career, a great Australian, let's not forget. He was a great Australian, and actually I think your discussion has been excellent about him because uh, Barry pretty much mocked everybody. He did uh, mock up, but he did a great deal of mocking down as well. 
um, mocking middle class Australia, I think, in a way that Australians found incredibly funny. Of course, it resonated with them. Um, all of us Australians can understand the sort of people that he he was mocking, um, but yeah. we loved him for it. Really, um, he was. The other, I, I want to say one other thing about him because I knew him very well, and over many years, Barry was a fantastic person in private. And as you you often find with comedians, privately when they don't have a scriptwriter for them. They're not actually quite so funny. But Barry was hilarious privately as well. Charming, hilarious, sort of in a, in a charming way, disrespectful. So he was a wonderful and lovable person. And it's a, such a sad day that he's died. And Alexander, he lived a very full life. I mean, what, what a body of work. And not just Dame Edna, but books as well. The Sir Les... Uh, Patterson character, who was also hilarious and obscenely rude and distasteful. I'm not sure he'd be allowed in our rather sensitive times in 2023. So a life well lived. And this is a guy, by the way, who I think had issues with, with uh, the demon drink, but overcame those and never looked back. Uh, yes, I mean, he, li he lived a very well, you might say he lived a very full and a very good life. There's no, uh, and, and, and maybe bits of it, as with every life, were not so great. But um, he was, he was, an, he had eclectic tastes as well. So he knew a huge amount about art and about music. Um, was was uh, quite an intellectual, really, Barry Humphreys. Um, a very good writer. Um, very strong views on politics, which I won't explore now on this program, but he, I'll put it this way, he wasn't exactly politically correct, Barry Humphreys, in his Definitely private not. Concert. Definitely not an antidote to our politically correct times. Um, look, uh, Josh, the other great skill set that Barry Humphreys had, and I, I saw it at a live <laughs> show in Edinburgh in the late 90s, was his improvisational skill. Now, we know that he was a great writer, and some of those fantastic one-liners from Dame Edna demonstrate fabulous craft. But this guy could think on his feet. Uh, at this show in Edinburgh, he addressed a woman in the crowd and he was talking about her dress and he said it looked like a sleeping bag. I mean, it was just absolute gold. So a um, great, great improviser as well, Josh. Yeah, I mean, it, he had the full package and that's why people use the word like genius with someone like him because he, could, he really could do it all. And I'm not a massive fan of character comedy generally, but I think it's because he imbued that character so fully, like I said, you just don't necessarily think that he was a character. And it is interesting also to hear Alexander's uh, comments about him, about him being a good person, because that goes to my personal theory that comics who portray themselves on stage as being nice people tend to not be nice people in real life, and the comics who are actually sort of monsters on stage tend to be very nice uh, in real life. And I might say that uh, you, Mark, on stage are very nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Enough said about that, the better. Uh, Josh knows where the uh, bodies are buried. Uh, Alexander, obviously, we, we've mentioned the importance of Barry Humphreys as an Australian. I enjoyed one of his books, which was about his childhood growing up in Australia. Uh, it was that yeah. sort of dull suburban life that inspired Dame Edna, the housewife turned superstar. Um, but he was, he became, didn't he, the sort of adopted son of the UK, along with a few other legends like Clive James, uh, Jermaine Greer and others. Do you think he paved the way for our appreciation of Australian culture in this country? Um, I hadn't really thought of it like that. Um, I'm not sure that, um, that the answer to that is that he did. But So he opened a window into um, what you might call, well, how could we best describe it, middle-class Australia. You know, Dame Edna was said to come from a suburb of Melbourne called Mooney Ponds, which is a sort of quintessentially kind of lower middle class suburb, or it was. Um, and um, he opened a window into that that sort of aspect of um, Australian society, um, which is a is it's a big component of Australia. There's no doubt about that. Um, and he definitely mocked but mocked it in a way um, that everybody, including that demographic in Australia, could really enjoy and laugh at. I don't know. It's, 
as you've all been saying, I mean, he was an absolute genius at uh, making people laugh, whoever they were. Um, but, I mean, Australia isn't a, a country particularly given to comedy, no more so than the UK. Perhaps actually, on the whole, slightly less so than the UK. Um, but he was one of the funniest people ever to come out of Australia. And, you know, the sad thing about him dying is there just aren't many funny people left. You don't hear many funny things. You don't have much of an excuse to laugh anymore because, you know, it seemed to be incorrect to laugh. Yeah. I, I think you're right. I, I think that's a really good point made there by Alexander Downer that it's naughty comedy and it's willing to be wildly outrageous, Josh. We're going to miss that. I think we lost that with the sad death of Joan Rivers and I think we've seen it again today with Barry Humphreys. Yeah, and also you think like how he's in the Melbourne Comedy Award, Barry Awards. I think they took his name off it because of certain comments yeah. that he said. And you, when you hear about younger comics sort of disparaging uh, the the people who came before us, and people, frankly, who myself and many others cannot even raise a candle to, uh, let alone a torch, uh, and then taking their his name off their main comedy award, that just seemed that's mental to me. Um, Alexander, what a thrill to have you on the show to remember a true, true great Australian. Uh, my thanks to the former Australian High Commissioner to the UK, Alexander Downer. Thank you, sir. And also my thanks to the brilliant comedian. He's also edgy, he's also naughty, and he's live at 11 for headliners, Josh Howie. Thanks, Josh. Uh, well, there you go. Your favourite Dame Edna jokes, let me know. Mark at gbnews.uk. Coming up next with the pundits. Is voter ID undemocratic? Are smokers treated as second-class citizens? And here's a brain teaser for you. Is it wrong to leave a partner when they fall ill? I'll see you in two. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. Oh, I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it, like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain is watching. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are, we don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you know Kate Moss? Moss? <laughs> Apparently. Uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no. no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. Crop failures, famine, war, yeah. suffering on a scale completely uh, unimaginable. We are putting the cart before the horse. As Charles I said at the scaffold, he was the true defender of liberty. Yeah, I've completely derailed the conversation. <laughs> Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. 
New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Join us every Saturday from 8 p.m. as we debate the week's stories. Right, folks, that Ooh. was a spicy one, wasn't it? With us four, plus a special guest. Sometimes she has to stick her foot in it. Sometimes she has to say things as they are. Sometimes I think we should keep the refugees and send the pensioners to Rwanda. <laughs> then we'd be in a much better state. Well, Benjamin, yeah. that is that. The Saturday Five. Saturday nights from 8. Only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Uh, welcome back to the show. Let's take a look at some of your emails, uh, mark at gbnews.uk. Uh, they are just coming in thick and fast. And uh, how about this from Robert, who says, William Hague is a prize numpty. I completely agree with you in your big opinion monologue. How dare he erase women in that manner? Well, if you've just tuned in, you've missed my big opinion. It's all about William Hague telling women that they've effectively got to get over it and accept if biological males identifying as female enter female spaces or join the Women's Institute. Roisin from our digital department has crafted it into a video so you can re-watch my big opinion on Twitter right now at GB News. But reacting to the big stories of the day, we've got my top pundits. TV news legend John Sargent. Journalist and author Peter Lloyd. And model, actress and entrepreneur Ashleen Organ-Wallace. Now, for the first time in England, local election voters will be required to show ID before casting their ballot. Chaos has been forecast as apparently up to three and a half million people don't have photo ID and only 50,000 people have applied for a voter authority certificate. So are voter ID rules undemocratic? Peter. I don't think so. I think, you know, politics is a very dirty game and it's not just politicians who are ruthless. Sometimes voters can be ruthless. You only have to look at what happened in Oldham oh, yeah. in, I think, 2000. There were 11 people prosecuted for voter fraud. And sometimes they were using the names and identities of dead people to cast votes. And they were all Labour and Lib Dem supporters. So you have to say, look, anything that maintains or protects electoral credibility is a good thing. And you have to go and present photo ID if you want to pick up a parcel from the post office. Why can't you do that when you cast your vote in an important democratic moment? You know, sh surely it just makes perfect sense. However, Ashleen, shouldn't it be as easy as possible to vote? Absolutely. Well, wait, wait, I wasn't expecting you to say that. Of course it should that be as effortless. easy. effortless. Yes, it should be. You literally sort of stagger into the polling station yeah. in your, your flip-flops. Yeah, drunk from last night. And just night. sort of spit on <laughs> one Not sure of your decision mm. and just tick a we, box. We don't yeah. want barriers, do we, to, to democracy? <laughs> no, I, I, I disagree with you, if I'm honest. I think that, I think it's a good idea and I think eventually, yes, it should be put into place. But I don't think there's a massive problem in the UK. I've, you said about 11 people, right? Yeah. 11, I mean... Yeah, it's OK, it's 11 people, but it, it, compared to America, for example, that, you know, mm. the, I think that it's a good idea, but it needs a, a lot longer of a rollout. We need more put in place for people that don't have the idea or, or don't know how to go and get... Apparently, there's, there's something in place that you can go and get, like, a form to, to make you be able to register to vote, but I didn't even know about that until mm. today's topic. So how many other people know about it? Not many. So, John, is this potentially the idea of uh, that, that it's, it's a potentially long-term solution, but not now? Well, no, people are worried about whether or not, when it's first used properly, which will be in, in May next month, um, will it be a shambles? Will, in fact, people turn up thinking they can vote and then told, no, you can't? Mm. So there are going to be teething problems, there's no doubt about that. And people will then say, oh, they should have left it. But, no, it's, I'm afraid it's going with the grain of where we've got to be. And if you think of what happened with Trump in America, okay. with people shouting we was robbed, we can't have that. And the, although the numbers are small, as mm. Peter says, the way that things are now displayed... All you need is 15 people to be arrested or something. People say, oh, they're all doing it. So you may as well get ahead of the curve, mm. and I, I totally agree with that. I think people will find, as we get closer to the 7th of May, you'll find the broadcasters, including your good self, will say, now, wait a moment, if you're going to vote, mm. 
do remember this because it is new mm. and people don't want to be told look in a few weeks time you're gonna to have to know this they need to know a few days before so I'm hoping that when it happens the turnout for local elections is always much much smaller than for a general election mm. so let's assume for the sake let's be optimistic and think look a few days before more and more people realize oh yeah I've got to take my driving license got to take my freedom pass got to take this got to take that as long as it's got a photograph and as long as the officials involved um, take it oh I see what you mean you've got that that's close enough and not be sort of too dogmatic about why haven't you got a passport why haven't you got this the other thing I think is important is that when voters go through the system they should realize the first bit is are you eligible to vote mm. the second bit completely private completely secret you are now allowed to vote but you're allowed to vote whichever way it is mm. and if people are confused thinking oh well the next thing they'll do is they'll ask me how I'm gonna vote no of course they're not gonna be doing that so people you've almost got to sort of separate it up as a kind of you know, you go into the voting booth and, and, and stopping people, first of all, saying, don't worry, this is not the voting, this is registration. Mm. Then, would you go through that door, and I wish it was separate, whereas now at the moment it's just a that, table. That would be helpful. As brief as you can, though, mm. does this favour the Tories, given the fact that younger people are less likely to have ID? Depends on the area. Right. I mean, there are an, an awful lot of very clever young people who know exactly well, in fact, what I'll, to do. Let me do. tell you, my, my 17 year old son's got about three IDs, but we won't, <laughs> yeah. we won't go into it. And they're the ones who want to. The young people want to drink, of course, so they've got to prove you know, something. They should allow people to vote on their smartphones. You think that's how mm. we should do it? Yeah. Deploy smartphone technology? It mm. would be so democratic. It would what, take a selfie as you do it? Everybody's got a smartphone. Mm. There's, there's facial recognition software. Let people vote on their smartphones. Well, that probably... That is, would rule out the older that, people. That is the future. But, you know, John raises a good point. The credibility of election outcomes is central to any healthy democracy. Michael Gove had a rooftop smoking hut constructed because he mm. was being heckled in the street when he was out having a quick Rothmans. Now, uh, smokers have had a rough ride, even though Rowan Pelling of The Telegraph says in today's paper that she's tired of denying it. Smoking is fundamentally glamorous. Of course, we can't all be glamorous smokers like Audrey Hepburn or Nigel Farage. But are the government treating smokers as second-class citizens? Ashleen. Well, I think they should, quite frankly, because it's the, the passive smoking it does so much damage to people that are not smokers, to babies. Uh, there should be laws put in place that they can't, you know, sit next to me and smoke if they want to. I love the fact that I can go out now and come back and not need to wash my hair after going to a bar because I just stink <laughs> of cigarette smoke. So, and... I mean, to say smoking's glamorous is just, just very dangerous. Very dangerous. Very well, dangerous. if you're watching, ignore everything you've heard. Uh, let's talk about this uh, rather powerful story. A woman has uh, written an article about her decision to leave her fiancé after he was diagnosed with brain cancer. She said she couldn't face the uncertainty or provide the support that he needed. So it's clearly a complex story. My heart goes out both to her and her partner. It's clearly been a horrible time. But it begs the question, is it wrong to leave a partner when they're ill, Peter. Well, we were just joking about this, weren't we? We said it depends how much money they've got, which is really distasteful because this poor man has been really ill. That sounds like classic John Sargent. But, no, I'm not. But it was I'm him. not joining this. It was this. him. It wasn't me. He said it. No. But these subversive remarks. Is she insured? Is always what in he asked of everybody. Doctor. No, do you know what? I think it's representative of our narcissistic society. Mm. I think, you know, one of the greatest things you can do is make a sacrifice for somebody else. And if they're I ill... I'd like to say I'd like to say that I stayed with my partner as he was passing away. Oh, actually, I'm so sorry, really? yeah, no, 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 and I stayed with him. He got um, septicemia. Uh, he was in an, in an accident and he was paralysed from the neck down. Oh my goodness! And then he got septicemia, and I wouldn't have dreamed of right. leaving him. And he didn't have any money, so. I, I think it's I think it's disgusting to even suggest that. I think it depends on depends on, on what it is. I mean, some of these brain tumours change people's no, personality. No, he's you know, so, absolutely right. And in so fact, a friend a friend of mine's partner has suffered a head injury as well, which obviously is similar. But that doesn't mean you should leave and, them. And his personality changed, and it affected their marriage. That's mm. that's that's okay. But 
you don't leave them. You know, you get married in, in sickness and in health till death do us part. What about boyfriend, girlfriend? But, yeah, well, I was boyfriend, girlfriend, and I stayed mm. because because leaving someone at their most vulnerable point. No, no, of course well, where, Where's your heart? That's where, cool. Where's yeah, your empathy? That's... Where's your, you know? Well, you're all saying mm. the right thing. You've clearly done the right thing. You've, got, <laughs> you've walked the walk. Mm. But Peter, hand on heart, if you've just been dating <laughs> some, <laughs> someone for, <laughs> for a few weeks, maybe a couple of months. See, this is why I'm always single, because it just avoids all these complex issues. <laughs> she, says, she, she takes you by the hand and she looks at you with her big blue eyes and she says, I'm afraid of, I've got the IBS. <laughs> the IBS has kicked in. I'd, I'd say, uh, um, what would I say? I'd say, ask John take Sargent, some, he knows. Take some roll. He's the wise one, look, ask John I, Sargent. No, no, look, I've been mad for so long that the idea that I would leave my wife in those circumstances, it's not, not so you much... You just said you know what, John, you, you've got to, you've got to do the politician's <laughs> answer. You've got to say, I, I, I don't foresee the circumstances. No, no, the, 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 the truth is, that you wait... Look, if you've been married, as I have, for 54 years... Well, John. You're sort of way past the, you know, what do we do if... No, 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 you are there for, for until the end, aren't you? There's yeah. Not, it's yeah. just ridiculous otherwise and and also remember what you're not talking about so much you you may think you're talking about your relationship with your ill partner mm. but actually what you're really talking about is what kind of person are you and that That's does not true. change that's exactly right it's a personality diagnostic tool uh, well coming up next so excited about this my mark meets guest live in the studio is the man born in a caravan at the side of a road in Leicester who went on to make a multi-million pound fortune his incredible story is next. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's all ready and waiting. They're itching to go. And it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, three till six. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. Three till six p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Hello, I'm Calvin Robinson. Do not miss my Common Sense Crusade Saturdays at 7pm. Join me for some in-depth discussions on faith. Is that not the start of the slippery slope? It's very much so. And the big moral questions of the day. <laughs> I'm baffled. You've got some nerve. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel.
Very excited about this. It's time now for Mark Meets. And tonight, a man born in a caravan at the side of a road in Leicester who went on to make a multi-million pound fortune and become the richest Romany gypsy in British history. Among his many business interests, he's the chairman of Wildcrest Parks, Europe's largest holiday and residential park company. He's reportedly worth well over half a billion, but that's not enough for this ambitious entrepreneur who is in pursuit of his first billion. He has a car collection, which includes, we're told, a £1.6 million Bugatti Veyron, and his back garden has a helipad, which serves his £3.7 million Airbus Aston Martin helicopter. Uh, he's neighbours with Cliff Richard in Barbados, and he's become something of a celebrity, appearing in the hit ITV show Undercover Big Boss, where he awarded an employee a life-changing amount of money. It's the ultimate rags to riches story. Alfie Best, welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. Wow, thank you very much. <laughs> what a life, what, are your, what a career you've had. The story continues. Um, sadly, lots of people are born into poverty as you were. What made you different? I think it's the cards we're dealt and it's how we play them in life. Mm. You know, you can either accept a bad hand and give up or accept a bad hand and bluff your way to the top. I understand that you were born in this caravan and that it was snowing at the time and your parents couldn't get to the hospital. That's right, yeah. I was born in a, a lay-by in Lutterworth. Um, there's a documentary that is being launched, a documentary film, it's being launched at the Cannes Film Festival and it's called The Gypsy Billionaire. Mm. Um, and sometimes I find it a bit surreal um, because I don't feel any different um, I work as hard now as I would have done, you know, 10 years, 20 years ago. It's, it's an irrelevance. Success isn't a destination because um, you can be successful today, you can be unsuccessful tomorrow. So it's a, it's a consistent path that we've all got to keep going at. What drives you? What gets you up in the morning? Fear. Fear of losing everything. Because I think fear does two things to you. It can destroy you or drive you. I choose to use it to drive me. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to be financially poor, and you can be poor in many other different ways, from mindset to uh, personality. But for me, talking on a financial level, that's what drives me. I've been blessed now with Wildcrest Parks to be able to change a lot of other people's lives, yeah. and with Park Home Living, that's what we're doing. Yeah, and that allows people at the lower end of the economic ladder to have a good home and possibly reserve some of their disposable income for other, other things, not just accommodation, because the cost of housing in this country is a scandal. Absolutely. Um, can you tell me a bit about your childhood? You've never played the, the victim card, but you had a pretty rough time, it's fair to say. Um, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't feel I did have a, a rough time. You know, when people say about how bad it was or how poor it was, yeah, it, it was poor, but I didn't know that. Um, and I'd be a liar to sit here to say that I had a hard childhood. I had a fantastic mother and father. Were we poor? You know, we lived off the land. Mm. You know, we had hair coursing dogs and, you know, what we killed, we ate. And, and, and that was genuinely the case. But to me, it wasn't hard. I think it's only hard when all of a sudden you know a better life mm. and you then step down to that life. Was there a moment where you changed your life and changed your outlook? I think my outlook changes every week. Yeah. My mindset changes every year. And I can honestly say to you that I've become a different person to how I would have thought 40 years ago to how I think now is I'm changing every day. Uh, how do you feel society characterises the Romani gypsy community? It comes with a stigma, you know, gypsies, tramps and thieves. You know, that's a stigma and the bar is set higher for me to get over. You know, that's, that's something that actually has helped me. You know, I don't see it as a burden. I see it as a blessing. You know, we can all go through life and, as you said, Mark, play the victim. But the truth of the matter is if you play the victim, you become the victim. Mm. If you play the successor, you have a good chance of becoming it. Briefly, if you can, what's next for you? Global domination of the mobile home park sector. Yeah, because you're the biggest in Europe, so you're hoping to be number one in the world.
Yes. Um, can you imagine a career in politics? Could you be Britain's Donald Trump? Well, I think I'll leave that to the professionals. I don't know. I think we'd be in safe hands compared to this current shower. Um, Alfie, a thrill to have you on the programme and congratulations on everything you've achieved. Uh, what an inspiring conversation. My thanks there to Alfie Best. Uh, your reaction to the conversation you just heard, Mark, at gbnews.uk. So much to come in my take at 10. Strap yourselves in, folks. I'll be dealing with Meghan Markle, whose attacks on the monarchy continue. The Just Stop Oil protesters who need to grow up and get a job and why Britain needs to start making babies again. Plus, the Sunday papers and my pundits are back. All of that to come after this short intermission. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <laughs> I'm Michelle Jubery and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock. It's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Saturday nights on GB News. From 6pm, I'll give you my unique take on the world today. Then at 7, it's me, Calvin Robinson, with my common sense crusade. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Five times the opinion. Join us every Saturday from 8pm as we debate the week's stories. With us four, plus a special guest. And at nine, of course, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Saturday nights on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. What a fantastic conversation we had there with a very, very inspiring businessman, entrepreneur, you name it, Alfie Best. Uh, inspiring stuff. Lots of emails coming in. Mark at gbnews.uk. Keep your responses coming. It is 10 o'clock and this is Mark Dolan tonight. In my take at 10, I'll be dealing with Meghan Markle, whose attacks on the monarchy continue. The just stop oil protesters who need to grow up and get a bloody job and why Britain needs to start making babies again. Rest assured, watching this show is the ultimate aphrodisiac. Plus, tonight's newsmaker is the queen of US showbiz royal and political reporting, Kinsey Schofield, with all of the big stories on the other side of the pond, including huge excitement stateside in the build-up to the King's coronation. And you won't believe this, but bumbling Joe Biden wants another four years 
in the White House. We'll react to that shortly. And at 10.30, sharp, you can set your watch to it. It's the Sunday front pages in the company of my brilliant pundits. So a cracking hour to come. Big guests, big stories and big opinions. Meghan Markle's next. She's for the chopping board. But first, the headlines with GB News royalty, Ray Addison. Thanks, Mark. Let's give you the latest. The Prime Minister has chaired an emergency Cobra meeting as fierce fighting in Sudan enters its second week. Government forces are battling with a paramilitary group over control of the capital Khartoum. Sudan's military claims foreign nationals and diplomats, including those from the UK, US and France, are to be evacuated. The World Health Organization says more than 400 people have been killed and thousands injured since the violence began. The SNP has appointed Stuart MacDonald as the party's new treasurer, following the resignation of MSP Colin Beattie. Mr Beattie stepped down after he was arrested by police investigating SNP finances. He was later released without charge. The party's former chief executive, Peter Morell, who was also Nicola Sturgeon's husband, was also arrested and questioned before being released. Police are investigating the use of £600,000 in donations meant for the independence campaign. A serving member of the British Armed Forces has appeared in court charged with offences under the Official Secrets Act. 36-year-old Thomas Newsom is accused of sharing highly sensitive military information. He's alleged to have shared a 10-page document through social media to two senior officers who did have clearance and one civilian who did not. Prosecutors claim if the information was leaked, it would have caused a real and immediate threat to British people outside of the UK. He's due back in court on Friday. The family of Stephen Lawrence have held a memorial service in Trafalgar Square to mark the 30th anniversary of his murder. The 18-year-old was killed in a racist attack while waiting for a bus in south-east London. It's alleged that the original investigation was hindered by racism and police corruption, meaning it took almost 20 years for two of his killers to face justice. Labour have condemned Dominic Raab's behaviour since his resignation yesterday, describing it as appalling and saying he shouldn't be blaming his accusers for his downfall. Former Deputy PM resigned after an investigation upheld two of the bullying allegations which had been made against him. Mr Raab claims a minority of those within Whitehall are, quote, effectively trying to block government. Belarus's military has completed nuclear weapons launch training in Russia. Now, it comes after President Putin said Moscow would station tactical nuclear weapons in the neighbouring country. It's thought that warheads could be moved to storage facilities in Belarus by July. Many have seen this as a warning to NATO over its military support for Ukraine. And tributes have poured in for Australian entertainer Barry Humphreys, who's died at the age of 89. During a seven-decade career, he was best known for his alter egos, including Dame Edna Everidge and Sir Les Patterson. Actor Jason Donovan described him as an entertaining genius. The Australian Prime Minister paid tribute to him, describing him as the brightest star in a galaxy of personas. We're on TV, online, on DAB Plus Radio and on TuneIn 2. This is GB News. Back now to Mark. Well, my thanks to Ray Addison, who's back at 11. Welcome to Mark Dolan tonight, a busy hour to come. Tonight's newsmaker is the queen of US showbiz royal and political reporting, Kinsey Schofield, with all the big stories on the other side of the pond, including huge excitement stateside in the build-up to the king's coronation. Plus, you won't believe this, bumbling Joe Biden wants another four years in the White House. What does that mean for Britain? Plus, we've got the papers coming up, the Sunday papers, with full pundit reaction. Plus, quids in. What's the best purchase you've ever got for a pound? Lots to get through. Big stories, big guests and always big opinions. We start with my take at 10. Bad news, folks. Birth rates are dropping. Nobody 
is getting it on, with young people more interested in doom scrolling on their smartphone, killing imaginary gangsters in computer games like Grand Theft Auto, or enjoying solo gratification from the many and abundant adult entertainment websites out there. If you don't know what kind of websites I'm talking about, just ask a member of parliament, most of whom are experts. Who can blame youngsters for pushing back on starting a family, given that high rents mean it's impossible to save for a future family? And with an ever-decreasing chance of getting on the housing ladder, they wouldn't have the space anyway. I think this is cultural as well, helped along by social media, with the young generation becoming increasingly narcissistic. It's all me, me, me. My space, my pronouns, my mental health, my wellness, my me time. Let me tell you, when my parents raised four kids whilst working around the clock, I don't think they had five minutes of me time in 20 years. This may or may not be a good thing, and this may not be their fault, but young people these days are more selfish. Having a family is, by definition, an act of humility, an act of sacrifice, something that's not even in the vocabulary of many self-serving youngsters. So who's going to look after us when we get older and work to fund our retirement? Well, it won't be our kids or grandkids. They'll most likely be on long-term sick due to stress or anxiety, having been triggered by a comedian or a book or something. So we will be looking after ourselves. Many of you watching or listening to this show may be looking forward to your retirement, smoking a pipe, eating boiled sweets with your grandson perched inappropriately on your lap, talking about the good old days and how rubbish music is now and how you can't hear the words they're singing, complaining about litter and noticing how young policemen look these days before falling asleep in front of another episode of Homes Under the Hammer, an episode you've seen three times already but it keeps on delivering. There's only one thing for it, folks. Pump the music of romantic superstar Barry White into every home. If the walrus of love's seductive, soulful tones don't get the birth rate up, nothing will. Come on, young people, just get it on. Now, just stop oil. Just stop oil just won't stop this week, attacking what must be the most carbon-neutral activity known to man. Two blokes knocking a few balls around a table with a wooden stick, which I like to call snooker. Which other low-tech carbon-neutral activities might these deluded thugs attack next? A game of Monopoly, perhaps? After all, that's all about the evil appropriation of property. What about chess with black and white squares on the board? Chess is probably racist, let's be honest. Or what about the classic card game Snap? Far too aggressive and gladiatorial for these fragile snowflakes. Snap! Snap! I wish these idiots would snap out of it. Well, this week's You Couldn't Make It Up award goes to the eco-zealots who were seeking to disrupt tomorrow's London Marathon, an event which involves no vehicles, no fossil fuels, just thousands of people quite literally running around Britain's capital. I mean, the runners might do a bit of farting after all those energy bars. And the sight of a sweaty middle-aged man bulging in lycra trying to demonstrate he's still got it could upset a few people. But a marathon is hardly going to hasten our demise as a species. It's pretty clear that these eco-terrorists who have disrupted the public and even risked lives by gluing themselves to motorways are largely populated by privileged, entitled, middle-class numpties who appear to be on a permanent gap year. Well, that's understandable. I wouldn't employ them, would you? But I've got a fantastic idea. His face just flashed up a second ago. I will support these characters to the hilt if they first deal with the biggest polluters. The United States, India, Brazil, and most importantly, mainland China. That's right, when they march across Tiananmen Square, dodging tanks, snipers and the Chinese National Guard, I'll be cheering them on all the way. Now, Princess Upstart herself, the publicity-shy self-publicist Meghan Markle, is back in the news. I wonder how that happened. This time in relation to those allegations of racism against the royal family, which are now starting to look older and more past their sell-by date than President Joe Biden. 
Rowing back on the initial racism allegation aired on the Oprah Winfrey non-interview, we're told that she's now claiming the lesser charge of unconscious bias, which is almost as bad. For the royal family to be hauled over the coals when one of their number merely speculated as to who the child would resemble when born would be hilarious if it wasn't so damaging. Has there been a family in history that hasn't discussed which parents the unborn child will look like? I'm pretty sure, and again, you've seen a picture of him just now, Ed Sheeran's other half, she must have had sleepless nights wondering whether their kids would inherit his ginger locks, or should I say, strawberry blonde. My own parents and my in-laws did it when we were expecting our two kids. In the end, the boys got my charm and good looks and their mother's feet and short temper. We're told in written correspondence with the King, in which she bizarrely interrogated Charles over this non-story, that Meghan Markle did not get a response she was satisfied with. We're told that, that is the reason for her absence from the coronation, as well as putting her children first. Forgive me for a moment whilst I throw up into a bucket. Family first, do me a favour. She's about as family first as Joseph Fritzl. And how dare she lecture the king and guilt trip him over these flimsy accusations. The arrogance and the narcissism of this woman knows no, no bounds at all. She is now such a diva, she makes Mariah Carey look like a low-maintenance shrinking violet. Thank God she's not coming to the coronation. If anyone could spoil a party, it's this entitled prima donna. She might have opened fire on our royal family, but with her absence on the 6th of May, King Charles has dodged a bullet. Well, we've been in touch with Meghan Markle's people. We've got a response in the last few minutes. Here is the statement. The Duchess of Sussex is going about her life in the present, not thinking about correspondence from two years ago related to conversations from four years ago. Any suggestion otherwise is false and frankly ridiculous. We encourage tabloid media and various royal correspondents to stop the exhausting circus that they alone are creating. Well, there you go. They've had their right to reply. What's your view, Mark, at gbnews.uk? Reacting to my take at 10. TV news legend John Sargent, journalist and author Peter Lloyd, and model and actress Ashleen Horgan Wallace. Uh, let's start with you, Peter Lloyd. Uh, has King Charles dodged a bullet with the absence of Meghan Markle from the coronation? Oh, absolutely. None of us on the panel wanted to hear, and nobody in the country probably wanted to hear. So, great. I love the fact that she's not going to be there. Nobody wants her anyway. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And can I just say, not only is she the biggest narcissist on the planet, but her behaviour smacks of coercive control. The way she has isolated Prince Harry from his family has got red flags all over it. The sooner they get divorced and he moves back to Britain, the better. Uh, well, look, you're honest as always and on the point. Ashleen, your reaction to uh, this debate, uh, of course, you know, Meghan Markle there in correspondence with the King, don't you think that Charles had better things to do than handle this woman's letters? Yeah, absolutely. I just, I just, I mean, I just don't think there's any place for her here, if I'm honest. Uh, at first, I wasn't anti Meghan and then I watched that documentary and yeah, it was given red flags, it was given narcissism, and she lost me the moment that she mocked and mimicked when she had to curtsy to the Queen. I mean, have some blinking respect for one mm. of them, a <laughs> better swear word. Yeah, she's honestly, there is no love lost. Stay, stay in America, honey. Uh, John Sargent, are you willing to defend Meghan Markle? Certainly not, no. I mean, the simple question, why isn't she coming to the coronation? I think there's a very simple answer, because if she did come, she would be booed. And that would not look good, it wouldn't film well, and she would find that very difficult to cope with. She's not loved here, she's got to know that. We used to love her, we probably loved her too much. Uh, that could well be uh, the issue. Uh, John, your reaction to the Just Stop Oil protests that we've seen this week, the Crucible Theatre for the snooker, potential disruption of the London Marathon tomorrow, which has got to be one of the lowest carbon events imaginable. Yeah, no, I think, I think it's extremely tedious, these demonstrations, and they're ruining the whole 
in the whole chance of proper demonstrations or a real feeling mm. about subjects that matter. And they don't seem to realise this. They don't seem to realise that most of their activities put people off. It doesn't right. encourage people. They don't think, oh, I must disrupt the next snooker game I see. I must make sure that I climb up um, over some bridge. I must make sure when I see a horse race that I rush in front and glue myself to the next jump they have to make. No, people don't think like that. Mm. And they, do, they seem to be, from that point of view, extraordinarily naive about the way that politics is enacted, even that kind of politics, the politics of protest. Mm. OK, and uh, Peter, how are we going to get the birth rate up? I mean, looking at you, you could help. <laughs> Well, I mean, I don't know. I think there's a chance that these two could have a, a child because there's, you know, I think there's some chemistry going on. Sorry, John, I know you're married. <laughs> but I, I'm, not, I'm not implying that John would ever do anything unfaithful. Or, but well, I'm just saying that the, the, ticking, the sexual waiting. chemistry, I'm just saying, it's there. It's there. John, don't look at me like that. You know what I'm talking about. It's electric. <laughs> It's electrifying. <laughs> Don't be silly now. Stay in your seat. We're a long way apart. All right. Ben. Sorry, Mrs. Sergeant. I'm only joking. Just for now, anyway. Let's wait until <laughs> the cameras turn off, darling. There you go. Well, listen, folks, See? your reaction to <laughs> Meghan Markle's absence from the coronation, her angry letters to uh, King Charles after that Oprah interview, of course, a few years ago now. Meghan says she wants to move on, but I'm not sure she does. Uh, and also the low birth rate. Are you worried? Uh, lots to come. Uh, next up... Could you face another four years of Joe Biden in the White House while well, he wants another run at uh, the presidency? We'll discuss that with the Queen of US Showbiz Royal and Political Reporting, Kinsey Schofield. She's next. Earlier on GB News Radio. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are, we don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you All know Kate Moss? Moves. Apparently. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair no, of jeans? No. no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I've walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. Crop failures, famine, war, yeah. suffering on a scale completely uh, unimaginable. We are putting the cart before the horse. As Charles I said at the scaffold, he was the true defender of liberty. Yeah, I've completely derailed the conversation. <laughs> Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. 
New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Join us every Saturday from 8pm as we debate the week's stories. Right, folks, that was a spicy one, wasn't it? With us four, plus a special guest. Sometimes she has to stick her foot in it. Sometimes she has to say things as they are. Sometimes I think we should keep the refugees and send the pensioners to Rwanda. <laughs> then we'd be in a much better state. Well, yeah. 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 The Saturday Five. Saturday nights from 8. Only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Across so many topics at exactly 10.30 when we got the papers as well. But it's time now for US News with the Queen of US showbiz royal and political reporting and one of the big stars of the Mark Dolan tonight coronation coverage. It is Kinsey Schofield. Hi, Kinsey. I've got my glasses. I'm packing. I've got my bunting for my hotel room. I am coming so prepared. You won't even believe how prepared I am. Oh, we're going like, to give you lots of British treats. You're going to have jellied eels, which are very London, a pint of bubbly ale. We're going to have a great time. Kinsey cannot wait for this, and neither can America. I feel like the excitement is building stateside. It is. It is. I mean, I think for, you know, the younger generation, this is the first time they've seen something as extraordinary as uh, King Charles's coronation. And you know, I do think he's unique in the fact that he, he is traditional, but he's also attempted to modernize the monarchy for decades. Um, so I look forward to seeing some of those tweaks and changes he's making because I trust him in a lot of those. I think you're right. I think he's got off to a great start as monarch. He's uh, dynamic. He's man of the people. And it's going to be a sensible but celebratory affair. Uh, there's a story that's just broken in the Sun newspaper. I know you're across this. And it's uh, in relation to Prince Harry, who we're told might be homesick. Tell me more. That's right. Uh, the source uh, to the Sun said that Harry was desperate to return for the coronation. He was so homesick that he was eager to reconnect with his family and missed some of his friends. And I, you know, I, I wonder, Mark, you know, is, is he truly happy after all of the destruction over the last few years? Uh, is he alone on an island? called Montecito. You know, I do think that he probably misses the pomp and ceremony. And he said during that Netflix special that he specifically did miss some of the aspects of the royal family when they got together, when they had some of those old traditions that we just spoke about. So um, I I'm curious to see what his body language is throughout the coronation. Indeed, and notwithstanding all the conflict that we've seen between Hollywood and Windsor in the last few years, miraculously, King Charles and Harry have managed to keep something of a relationship going. I understand it was a conversation between the king and his son that led to his acceptance of this invitation to the coronation. Yeah, and, and this source actually suggests that the ping pong game that we had heard about the negotiations wasn't necessarily the case. It was actually Harry eagerly trying to get a hold of his dad and his dad just being a little too busy with this i mean with becoming the new monarch with the coronation and everything mm. uh, and also they they did say that perhaps he wasn't necessarily 100 percent trusting of his son just quite yet um but it was not necessarily this ping pong game of negotiations harry just had a hard time getting his dad on the phone but once he did they both felt comfortable they had that heart to heart and now the king is looking forward to seeing his son at the coronation. Uh, what do you make of Meghan Markle's statement? We've just quoted it on the show. She thinks that all these stories about letters that she wrote to the then Prince of Wales, uh, now King Charles, in the light of the Oprah interview, she said it's old news. She wants to move on. Do you buy that? I love this quote, Mark. I mean, these are the same people that three years after they left the UK produced six hours of content for Netflix complaining about what happened three years ago, a book complaining about what happened three years ago or, or petty things that happened 20 years ago. They didn't get the biggest room. Oh, woe is me, champagne problems. <laughs> these are people that are fixated in the past. They are stuck in the past. And I would just, you know, I'm just suggesting the Telegraph has had very good access to Harry and Meghan leaks. They had spare before anybody else had spare. And they were the first ones to report that Harry had tried to see Charles when he was there for that lawsuit a few weeks ago and Charles refused to see them. So it does seem like somebody close to the Sussexes has a contact at the Telegraph. I'm just saying. That's all I'm saying. Uh, Joe Biden <laughs> wants to finish the job. Tell me more, Kinsey. 
Okay, so they're saying that Tuesday he's going to officially announce his run for presidency and that his motto might be finish the job. Mark, there is a grim reaper joke here that I refuse to make because <laughs> I'm above that. Um, but people are kind of just patiently waiting to see what comes out of his mouth on Tuesday. Will that be his official motto? We're going to have to wait and see, but Tuesday is the big day. But America is so bonkers that he could run and he could win. Please pray for us. Get on your hands and knees as soon as the show is over and just say a little prayer. Um, I mean, he could. I don't know. I, I, his, his, his approval rating is so bad right now that mm. I don't, you know, and it does seem like the Democrats, it's not going to be Robert Kennedy Jr., although I, I love a good Kennedy. Um, I, but it does seem like the Democrats are desperate to find somebody that they could slide in in, in his place because he's not he's not been a great reflection of the party. Most certainly. Well, you're a great reflection of GB News and you're going to be the face of our coronation coverage. On the eve of the coronation, that's Friday the 5th of May, I'll be at the palace with Kinsey, with Tom Bauer and many other luminaries. And Kinsey's doing the double because I hope if she's available, she'll be with us on Saturday as well for the big day. She's going to be everywhere because she is the queen of US showbiz royal and political reporting. And Kinsey, will see you in a week's time when the excitement will be at a fever pitch. Absolutely, see you soon. See you soon. The brilliant Kinsey Schofield. Check out her website, To Die For Daily, and her podcast of the same name. Very excited about uh, what's coming up because it is tomorrow's papers. It's the Sunday papers with full pundit reaction. Uh, the brilliant Ashleen Horgan Wallace, Peter Lloyd, and TV news legend John Sargent. So the Sunday papers next with some great headlines. See you in two. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's already in waiting, they're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, three till six. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. Three till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Hello, I'm Calvin Robinson. Do not miss my Common Sense Crusade Saturdays at 7pm. Join me for some in-depth discussions on faith. Is that not the start of the slippery slope? It's very much so. And the big moral questions of the day. <laughs> I'm baffled. You've got some nerve. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. 
Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Producer Cal is absolutely right. It's time for your feedback. Can I apologise? It's been such a busy show. I haven't had a chance to get to your emails and it's always the best bit of the show. So mm. is voter ID undemocratic, making people have identification when they vote? This from Brenda. Hi, Brenda. Good evening. How are you? Thanks for your email. Brenda says, hi, Mark. What's the fuss about? We lived in Australia for 34 years. At each election, you were forced to go to the polling station, presented your ID and the officer would cross you off on the electoral roll as you mm -hmm. were handed your voting papers. Why can't the Brits do it? Ridiculous fuss about nothing. Uh, Alan says, Mark, voter ID should be compulsory. Areas with a high volume of non-integrating backgrounds are block voting, not individually voting because they are told to. Um, this on our conversation in relation to... William Hague, who said that women have got to get over it and get used to the idea of biological males who call themselves women, who identify as females, entering female spaces, joining the Women's Institute. Well, I've got a correction from Carol. Carol says, hi, Mark, the WI have included trans women for a number of years, mm. even transitioning people. Please check your facts, says Carol. Carol, thank you for that. I always love it when you guys put me right, because this show is all about what you've got to say. And if you've got knowledge that I ain't, then please get in touch. Um, on the issue of uh, also changing rooms, this is the idea of unisex changing rooms rather than male and female. Quite a powerful email from Pat. Um, and Pat is a lady. Pat said, I've had a breast removed because of cancer. Women in changing rooms are interested to know what's happened and they're very sympathetic. I would be so embarrassed if a man oh. was in the changing room, which luckily has not yet happened. Uh, thank you for that. Actually, that is Val. Can I apologise? It's come from Pat's email. I think you've used Pat's email, but that's from <laughs> Val. So, Val, thank you for that. And um, I'm, um, I'm, I'm hopeful that you've made a full recovery. And thank you for your very honest uh, email. Um, quickly, is it wrong to leave your partner when they fall ill? No, says Margaret. You should not leave your partner oh. if they become ill. They need you even more at that time. Yeah. If I really love someone, I could not leave them if they were ill or incapacitated in any way. And last but not least, from Bridget. Hi, Bridget. How are you? Bridget has said, um, my partner has brain cancer. I stayed with mm. and looked mm. after my partner who had brain cancer until the very end. I wouldn't leave him at all. It's difficult because she's probably dreading the end, but there is help from brain tumour research. Uh, thank you for that, Bridget, and uh, may your partner rest in peace. I'll get to more of your emails shortly. You know I love getting them, Mark, at gbnews.uk. But it's time now for the papers. Hot off the press, and we start with The Express. And they lead with... Activist civil servants target Suella. Suella Braverman tonight vowed to press ahead with tough laws to tackle illegal immigration, as allies warned that activist civil servants are out to get her. A Tory MPs fear that officials who drove Deputy PM Dominic Raab from office now have their Home Secretary in their sights. They've told her to prepare for a vicious new whispering campaign as her key Stop the Boats bill returns to the Commons this week. We'll get reaction uh, from all of my pundits, including John Sargent, on that one. Prince Charming Louis turns five. I've got to say, William and Kate, uh, and also Harry and Meghan, they've got beautiful kids, haven't they? Next up, we've got the Sunday Mirror, Andreas. Is that right? Yes, indeed. XPM's fourth holiday since quitting. <laughs> well, I don't blame him. No, I don't. We'd all be <laughs> we'd all be on a permanent holiday if we were Boris Johnson, wouldn't we? <laughs> Johnson's 4K a night holiday at Lone Powell's Villa. Boris mm. Johnson and his family have holidayed at his tycoon cousin's four grand a night villa. The stay, their fourth vacation in uh, just, uh, I think it's uh, 12 months. We've got that little bit of text is cut off there. At the luxury Caribbean home of Sam Blythe. Um, there you go. Uh, it's nice work if you can get it. The Independent. Uh, goodbye, Possums. Tributes pour in for Dame Edna, star Barry Humphreys. And British Legion tells PM, help Afghan war heroes who helped us. The Royal British Legion has urged the government to honour its commitment to help Afghan war veterans as it backed the Independence campaign to stop the threatened deportation of an Afghan fighter pilot who arrived in Britain on a small boat. The Mail on Sunday next. K 
King Charles III coronation tea towel. Well, I want to get my dirty mitts on one of those, let me tell you. Also, special tribute, why Barry Humphreys stayed sober for 50 years. And eco-warriors and Republican fanatics could cause injury or death at coronation parade, senior security sources tell the Mail on Sunday. Extremists' vile plot to spook King's horses with rape alarms. And last, but no, no, not last, we've got plenty more, actually. Uh, the Observer, Tory plan to politicise civil service after Raab scandal. And care homes using revenge evictions to stifle complaints. Sunday Telegraph, Braverman, I'm ready to defy judges on migrants. And Sunak using Tory MPs as cannon, cannon fodder to shield himself. This uh, amid criticism on the part of the PM for not standing up for and defending Dominic Raab and keeping him in post. And last but not least for now, tributes and tears for Dame Edna Everidge star Barry Humphreys. Good night, possums. Fans and celebrities are mourning Dame Edna Everidge creator Barry Humphreys after he died in hospital aged 89. Hailed as one of the funniest people ever. And I would echo that sentiment. Mm. Those are your front pages. Got one or two more to come, but let's get full pundit reaction now from the brilliant journalist and author Peter Lloyd. TV news legend John Sargent. And, oh, I managed to get myself in the shot there. <laughs> We've also, our total egomaniac. Uh, here's me talking <laughs> about narcissists. We've also got the wonderful <laughs> broadcaster, model, and entrepreneur, Ashleen Morgan Wallace. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, well, let's get uh, straight into this if we can. And this story is deeply worrying, Peter. I think you'll agree. It's the Mail on Sunday mm. extremists' vile plot to spook the king's horses with rape alarms. Yeah, I mean, this is particularly concerning because it was only a few weeks ago that the Mail on Sunday did the story about the Grand National. Yeah. And that the activists were planning to disrupt the proceedings. Which and was I, great journalism. I mean, it was great journalism. And what was really scary about that is that the warnings weren't heeded. Activists were still allowed to infiltrate the events, cause disruption, and, of course, you know, it was devastating for people involved. Um, so what's really scary about this story is that it's likely... A, to be true, but B, it's also likely to be borne out with fact. Like, it's likely to happen. Yes, I mean, it's a very fine line between the right to protest and free speech versus right. breaking the law. Right. Where do we draw that line? I mean, it's such a grey area, it's very difficult to say, but, I mean, you know... <sighs> Let's just hope the horses kick them where it hurts. <laughs> <laughs> That's the answer. A bit That's of natural the justice. There you go. I mean, what, what would you do with, with protesters at the, the, the coronation? Because I think we can all agree that the right to protest is, is very sacred. Well, my, my dogs are really well trained. I'd have them attack them back. Because mm. basically using a, a noise against a horse is, is like an act of violence against the horse. Right. It's, it's, it's John, really John, bad. you've been covering politics for many decades with a distinction. Um, is this sort of civil disobedience familiar to you or has it reached a, a new level, would you say, a fever pitch? It's going through a phase and it does happen. It's a sort of people think, oh, well, let's do that. Mm. Then they go on saying, let's do that. And some people say, it's not really working, is it? So you've got to go through a whole cycle of education, particularly for young people, mm. to see how far they can push it, mm. what the reaction, the real reaction is, not just parents saying, don't do this and don't do that and don't do the rest of it. And they can see the whole thing played out. And they then realise that, in fact, is mostly, almost all of it is counterproductive. Mm. People are beginning to hate these demonstrations mm. and they're beginning to hate the people involved. And I suspect the coronation thing may find very difficult because most most of the crowd yeah. will not exactly be keen on the demonstrators and helping them along. No, they will turn on these people. And so the idea that all that it's only the police or the military mm. that can combat the demonstrators, no, it's ordinary people taking part, saying, don't do that, or else I'll hit you or I'll grab you. And it's very important for the, the, the people who've now been sent to prison for more than three years. It's very important that that holds and doesn't lose out on appeal. Mm. Because you've got to get... People have got used to the idea. Not only do you get a, a criminal record mm. if you take part in these violent demonstrations, you may lose your liberty. Now, that get, that's not much fun, is it? But the whole argue, jolliness of, yeah. oh, we're gluing ourselves and it's all so exciting, becomes less exciting mm. after a few months of being in prison. Well, and I think it ties in with your comments about William Hague as well, that I think these eco-protesters are out of step with public opinion. I think mm. the public are concerned about pollution, they're concerned about climate change, right. uh, but what they don't want is to see ambulances blocked on the motorway. They mm. don't ex appreciate the methods 
or indeed the hysteria, Peter. Right, exactly. It's such a turn-off. The, the frustrating thing is that they do have a point. There is a mm. kernel of truth to what they're yeah. saying. They, you know, yes, we should be custodians of the earth, or et cetera, et cetera. We should be mindful of our activities. But the way they are operating and executing their plans is counterproductive. It's turning people off. It's so naive. It also appears to be a very simple way. It's making our planet look rather unpleasant. Mm. You know, I mean, that's right. a, a curious kind of disjoint between we believe in goodness, we believe in nature, right. but by the way, we're gluing ourselves mm. and we're causing mayhem to ordinary people. The, the whole thing is sort of odd, isn't it? It's you know difficult mean? because they, they do have a... They're, fight, they're trying to fight a good cause, but it's mm. just, as you say, they're the way they're going it. about it. Yeah, exactly, they're wrecking it. Ashleen Braverman, I'm ready to defy <laughs> judges on migrants. How do you think, how strong do you think public feeling is about the illegal migrant crossings? Well, I just, I, I mean, I can't speak for the public. I don't know. I mean, I think people are... But unlike a lot of people on Twitter, you do inhabit the real world. <laughs> sort of. You do. You look really? just normal to me. <laughs> she got up like that. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I woke up like this. <laughs> um, no, listen, it's it's dangerous, and I'm more concerned about the people's safety, to be honest, uh, yeah. coming across. And um, what was your question? Well, yeah, that? I mean, it's it's a that's the issue. It's it's a humanitarian, yeah, national yeah. security, and economic crisis, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. There are, there are uh, many elements to it. Exactly. I mean, the idea is that Braverman will stand up to judges if they if they seek to push back on her Stop the Boats policy. The bottom line is it's in the Tory party manifesto to mm. end the illegal crossings. She's got every right. And, John, they've got a, what is it now, a working majority of about 70 seats? Yeah, they've got that. But bear in mind that right across Europe this has become a big issue. So the assumption that there are these people across the Channel who are egging them on the whole time and saying, Gore, what lovely <laughs> migrants, away, go across there. <laughs> now, some of the people may have done that some time ago, mm. but increasingly the judges in Strasbourg for the Court of Human Rights realise that, wait a moment, there are lots of government and if they're not careful, it's not just question of Britain withdrawing from the human rights legislation, maybe you'll get a large, a, a large battery of people right across Europe saying, what a good idea. Yes. And that's what they've got to be careful that's of. The, the French ignore the ECHR all the time, as, as Poland do and several other EU nation states. It is just an advisory court, uh, but it has political implications. It's a diplomatic issue as well. And our reputation, it was Winston Churchill was instrumental in drawing up uh, the European mm. uh, Court of Human Rights uh, in order to prevent another Hitler. So it, it's a complex one, mm. but are you, are you backing Bravman on this one, Peter? I am, and I hope she's successful, but I really think she's going to be the next victim of the Whitehall blob. You know, we've seen... Well, yeah, and that's a big story, isn't it, across the... Right, I mean, it's on, right the front page of the, it's on the front page of the Express, it. right? Yeah. So, you know, obviously now... We were talking earlier about Dominic Robb, and I'm sure he's got his character flaws, but this has set a low bar for what constitutes bad behaviour. And now I think we're at a very dangerous mm. precipice. There's a risk now where any kind of strict managerial assertive behaviour, any kind of dynamism is mistook as bullying or racism. And it happened to Pretty Patel. Right, it happened to Pretty Patel. And of course, it's convenient that all of these things happen to Conservatives, right? It yeah, never happened. Brexiteer Conservatives? Right, it never happened. Right of the party? Never happened to Angela Rayner, or it never happens to Jeremy Corbyn. So. I mean, activist civil servants target Suella. Uh, public anger is, is, is bubbling away out there. I'm seeing it on, on emails to this right. show. People are angry about the departure of Dominic Raab for that same reason, that they think that. Essentially, what he was trying to do is fulfil the wishes of the British people, particularly in relation to policing our borders. So, do you think... I mean, what is, what is the timeline for Braverman? Do you think she can turf this out? Well, I don't know. I think, having seen what happened to Rob, I'm not particularly optimistic that she's going to be able to deliver. I hope that she can, because I do think it's a big issue that needs to be addressed. But I think that the fifth column that operates in yeah. Whitehall is so powerful and so influential that they will probably win. John, uh, Braverman is a totemic figure within the Tory grassroots, isn't mm -hmm. she? She is, and it's a very popular issue with the grassroots in terms of do something about it, stop the boats. Uh, that's obviously going to win a lot of votes. Uh, it's the trouble about these stories is very Sunday newspaper, isn't it? Because you can constantly say, sources close to. Well, who are the sources? <laughs> Civil servants, in fact, can't say anything except the ones who retired, and they've been absolutely firm on this. Mike 
experience, certainly working with civil servants and covering these stories over the years, is I'm very surprised at the idea that they can group together in some kind of conspiracy. Because you can spot that. It's all very well. Do you think this took a long time? Do you think it's far-fetched that the, 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 the yeah, Brahms, I think the whole uh, thing is exaggerated. Was, was orchestrated. You're not having that. No, the whole thing is exaggerated. They do not have a gender. It took a long time for them to, as it were, get uh, Dominic Raab. And you think that some of these things went back four years. So the idea is this all-powerful blob that will act like some sort of alien force, <laughs> picking off ministers, <laughs> and it'll all be a fantastic conspiracy, strikes me as being one of those Sunday newspaper stories that, when it comes to it, are not quite as exciting as they seem. Uh, John, briefly, if you can, again, um, do you think that Rob has been done up like a kipper? That's the view of many of my no, listeners. I, I think he's done himself up. I think he has got a character flaw. He's not the kind of person that should be running a government department. Um, I think it's a bit hard but to he say he shouldn't standards. be an MP. He tells he, workers that he's, their, their he's work a, is substandard. No, he's very driven, he's very intense personality, mm. but it's quite clear from the number of complaints from different people in different sectors, some of whom are not prepared to put their name on them, which makes it more difficult. But this, this lawyer, who's a law and employment law, Tommy, Mm. I think he's done an extraordinary job. I've read the report. 47 pages. And it is an extraordinary kind of careful... You know, you can see months of work have gone into it. <laughs> and the idea that, oh, we can just ignore that and it's all a lot of old rubbish. No, he, uh, Rob is arguing in this strange way that the public want him to be high-handed, vindictive and all this. Of course they don't. No, Pizza? they may want some of his policies, but they don't want that behaviour in a government minister. They don't actually want government ministers to be involved in rows with their top civil servants. I'm not convinced. I mean, Tully dismissed six of the eight allegations against Rob. So I think it's a little bit more complex than that. And another That's question is whether or not yeah. it was a sackable offence or would an apology have sufficed? Uh, look, we've got more front pages coming up. It is the Sunday Papers. Um, a cracking story uh, coming up in, uh, let me tell you, I think it's the Sunday Times. Yeah, looking forward to that. Plus, my pundits will be nominating their headline heroes and back page baddies. Plus, what's the best thing you've bought for a quid? All of that next. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubery and I'm keeping you company right through until 7 o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock. It's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. 
I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, <laughs> right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers. Tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway. Headliners every night from 11 on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Saturday nights on GB News. From 6pm, I'll give you my unique take on the world today. Then at 7, it's me, Calvin Robinson, with my common sense crusade. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Five times the opinion. Join us every Saturday from 8pm as we debate the week's stories. With us four, plus a special guest. And at 9, of course, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Saturday nights on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to Mark Dolan tonight. It's the papers, as always, between 10.30 and 11. And let's have a look now, if we can, Andreas, at the Sunday Times. And they lead with MI6 spy sent to jihadist camp, killed own child. Report warned that he was emotionally unstable. PM's aides wanted to save Dominic Raab. Uh, and also Britain's trapped in Sudan war zone, a horrific story, which, uh, which of course, we'll bring you more on in the bulletin with Ray Addison in just a few minutes' time. Barrow boy Prince Louis holds on tight for a ride from his mother, the Princess of Wales, around the gardens at Windsor Castle. Uh, Ashleen Horgan-Wallace, what, a, what <laughs> a gorgeous little kid. Gorgeous. And, and we don't really talk about Prince Louis, do we? He's, no. he's the middle child. They always yeah. get ignored. They always get... I mean, <laughs> I can't relate. I'm an only child and <laughs> <laughs> was the apple of everyone's eye. But he's gorgeous, yeah. He's, uh, but why is he wearing a Christmas jumper? That's my only question. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> too right, too right. Um, uh, saving money, of course. Yeah, that's it? good. That's We've, good. Uh, Cal, what was that story about uh, best item for a pound? Because uh, I thought it was a, a, it was a cracking thing. We're going to talk about kind of budget purchases very shortly. Um, we, we do also have, uh, by the way, I should say, a, a quick line on Boris Johnson from the Sunday Mirror, Peter. Mm. Johnson's £4,000 a night hole at Lone Powell's Villa. Who cares? I mean, really, who mm. cares? This is such a Sunday Mirror story. I mean, <laughs> nobody else is bothered. They've still got this axe to grind against Bojo. He's not even in power anymore. Let it go. No, there's an election next year and from the on the, on the left, on the Labour side, they're so worried that Rishi Sunak will be the new, the change. Well, of course. And forget yeah. all the others. So there is an there's the a political element. There's a political now. element yeah. here. Mm. Keep Bojo yeah. up there in the stories. Yes. Make sure that Liz Truss gets plenty of coverage. Mm. Just remind people okay. that it's not all about Rishi, mm. because Rishi, on his own, as it were, has done a great deal to yeah. improve the Conservative standing. John Sargent, stop the mm. press. A man has bought a castle for a pound. I'm told it's not in great shape. It's something of a liability, but you've got to say it's a bargain. What's the best thing you've bought for under a quid? Under a quid? God. Don't say me, because no, it's I private can't. between us. <laughs> <laughs> it was only a nominal sum, wasn't no, it? No, <laughs> I tell you what, I did once get a painting for six pence. Now, that's equivalent now to, I don't know what, <laughs> three, three pence or something. But six pence, it was in a, uh, a, you know, a, a crazy sale in a village. And I've had it done up with a, with a very expensive frame. Have you still got it? Yes, and I bought it when I was eight or nine. Something oh, that's wow. great. And I, I look at that and I think, that's oh. not bad for sixpence, is Smart it? Smart investment. Oh. What is the painting? What is it of? It's of some people desperately fighting. It's a sailing picture. Oh, lovely. And the wind, of course, is coming onto the shore, so it's... it's uh, it's a fight to get the sailing ships out there, the little boats. Oh, that's wonderful. So they're all leaning and, and, and I suspect it's a copy. Sounds like, yeah, exactly. It could be a copy. It sounds like well, a, it could a, a be. It's such a, it's it's a such a good, it's such a good picture. Let, let's get you on Antiques Wear Show, celebrity special. <laughs> the drinks are on, John. <laughs> uh, brilliant stuff. Well, look, let's get to our headline heroes and back uh, page baddies right now. So, Ashleen, your, uh, your headline hero, if you could. So, my hero is Dame Edna Everidge, of course. Perfect. Honestly. Did she make you laugh? Mm. As I was growing up as a little girl, I was absolutely yeah. fascinated with her character and watched her in awe. Um, and hence the hairdo and the dress tonight, I thought I'd sort of do it sort of in, 
in, in remembrance <laughs> you, of You've her. got all the glamour <laughs> of Dame Edna. Glamorous all the glamour, her. all the wit as well. She's brilliant. Uh, John, you know, we, we've heard about genius this, genius that. Well, Barry Humphreys was a genius, a, a total one-off. Yeah, and, and the key point, I know it's such a blindingly obvious point, is how funny he was. Mm. He made people laugh. And all sorts of people just thought, God, oh, that's funny. And it meant that he could get away with all sorts of things. Mm. It would mean that he could pause, he could have this wonderful... Uh, uh, I like the, that woman called... What was she called? Madge or something? Madge, yeah. the assistant. assistant. The assistant. Yeah. And I thought that whole business and his apparent rudeness to her and the way she used to walk off and then come back in again was a wonderful contrast with what he was doing. And it's interesting, even someone as good as he was, a solo performer, mm. could actually do with a bit, and she provided it. Well, you know, too right. Humphreys was actually, I mean, he doesn't get credit for how intelligent he was. Most people don't know, but he actually studied law and philosophy at mm. university. Just something. And he served in the Australian military. Well, there you go. So a pair of cojones as well. Um, look, uh, clock's against us. Uh, John, your headline hero. My hero, Sybil Cook. You won't have heard of her. She died in 2021 mm. at the age of 91. Why is she a hero? Because just before the Second World War, at Easter of that year, she was thinking about... Uh, she had an Easter egg. And she decided that because the Poles, that the Germans were about to invade Poland, she wouldn't eat her Easter egg. And her uncle said, I wouldn't, you, I'd ration it. And so she kept the Easter egg and it's now up for sale oh, wow. uh, at an auction on the 18th of May in Derby. And the guide price is between 600 and 800 pounds. Just spectacular. <laughs> what a lady. You're, you're well, I'll give it to Sybil Cook. Like um, listen, I know, Peter, your headline hero is Dominic oh, Robb. Oh, God. Uh, and that is, that is actually John's back page baddie. Well, that's Meanwhile, why I chose it. That's why I chose it. You too. Like, you know, it's all about opinions. Uh, Nicola Sturgeon is your back page baddie, Ashleen. Peter, you get to close out the show. Who is Gail Bradbrook? Oh, so she is the founder of Extinction Rebellion, ah. who's been behind all this disruption and dreadfulness. And anyway, she was recently clocked shopping in a supermarket buying fruit that had been wrapped in plastic and <gasps> had a huge carbon footprint. And she was also driving around in a diesel car. Out. Oh. 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 One rule Shocking. for them, another rule for the rest Shocking. of us. Uh, my thanks to my amazing pundits, Peter, Ashleen and John. Loved it. Thank you for your company. An absolute joy to have you listening on the radio, watching on TV. I'll see you tomorrow at 9. Headliners is next. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything, I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things, we've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it, like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can